Well, it's Father's Day, and we always have to begin every Father's Day and every Mother's Day with a little caveat that says this is not for everyone their favorite Sunday, and I get that. For some, this is not a fun or uplifting day. Like I told you, I've been so excited for the last weeks. I just can't stand it. I just couldn't wait to get to church, but I know that that's not everybody. And uh, for many, this represents their saddest day of the year. Perhaps your father has recently passed, and so you are flooded with all the memories of your dad, and this becomes for you a sad day. Or perhaps there's a father that you never got to know. And by the way, it sounds like the rains are coming down. And if you get dripped on at the village, just move over or put an umbrella up. Either way, we don't care. Either way, it'll pass and that'll be good. But maybe there's a father you did not know, or maybe you knew too well, and you realized he never loved you. He never was what you needed him to be. That makes this a sad day. Maybe you're a father and you're estranged from your children. That makes today especially difficult for you. Or maybe you feel as if you've been a disaster as a dad. And you know what? That makes today painful. Um, a dad this week, uh, I know of, and I won't go into the details, but he just made a decision, thinking he was making a good decision, but it ended up not turning out so good, and he's feeling a lot of blame, and he's feeling a lot of guilt, and uh, Father's Day for him right now is very, very tough. I want you to know that if you are not feeling it today, God knows your pain, he knows your hurt, and he wants to be close to you today, and uh, I just want to remember you right now in a moment of prayer. So would you all bow your heads with me? God, right now we come into your presence and we recognize there are some people who don't feel particularly great about today. Maybe it's the absence of their dad. Maybe it's pain from their dad. Maybe it's their experience as a dad. But whatever it is, today is painful. And I just pray that somehow they will feel your touch today. They will sense that you have total love for them, that you are not mad at them, you have love for them, and you want to walk with them through whatever this stage of their life is. You want to walk with them, and you want to help them, and you want to teach them. And so for every person who's not feeling it today, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I think is good about Father's Day is I really think it's a day that you can evaluate. If you're a dad, you can evaluate your game, and you can kind of see what you need to do to step up. We have some young dads here, and uh, maybe there'll be some wisdom that'll be passed down today that maybe will cause you to have something trigger in your mind. Maybe an older dad will hear something. It'll be, you know what? That's something I should have done and something I want to do. But we want you to leave dads and moms, people who don't have any children, connected closer to God. Um, I have a friend, I tell him every year that I talk about him on our Father's Day service. He didn't grow up with a great dad. He didn't grow up with a great mom. His family life was really tough. He would run away from his house regularly to our house and stay with us. And he used to say, Ray, you have no idea how fortunate you are to have your parents. So now he's 56 years old and he has raised a son and a daughter and he made it his absolute life's mission to make sure that he was not a parent like the parents he grew up with. And I think that's wonderful. And so if you've had difficulties with your family, you can change that. You can make it a better world. You get um, in touch with God and see if he can't help you change that story. Uh, I want to say a word about people who never have children. I had dinner this past week with a gentleman who's never fathered a child, and yet he has been a surrogate dad to about six kids. And uh, we just talked about the joy that he had in seeing these kids grow up and how at their college graduations, they would hug his neck and say, you made it possible. So many of you don't have children and that's fine biologically, but you have actually been a part of so many people growing up and you've given of yourselves as a surrogate parent. And that's a really cool thing. I also want to say, just as by way of introduction, is there are people here who have been step parents or bonus parents, bonus dads, stepdads. And I want to tip my hat to you. I am honored today that my stepfather is here. Dwayne, where are you? Would you stand up? This is my stepdad, Dwayne Mayo. <clears throat> Being a great stepfather is not always easy, but occasionally you run into someone who has done it exceptionally well. That is my stepfather, Dwayne. He has done it exceptionally well. 
He became my stepfather nearly 40 years ago. He not only had been a great dad to his daughter, Delane, who died a few years ago with a cancer, but he had been a great dad to his son, Dee, who lives in Texas. But for the last 39 years, he has been a great stepdad to me and my sister. He has been a wonderful partner to my mom, which is the most important thing, and he has always been there to offer whatever support my sister and I needed. And I remember, Dwayne, I was even thinking about this. I remember back when I was 15 years old and Dwayne just had become my stepdad. And uh, I remember when he would want to help me as a young man trying to figure out my life, and he would want to be that step parent for me. Um, I, I, this will shock some of you maybe. I, I was in a, a chain fight when I was 15 years old. Very unfair, the other guy had a chain. I did not have a chain, so it was not equal in any stretch of the imagination. But anyway, so I got hit in the head with a chain, and it's kind of, there's a lot of anger and stuff. And I remember Dwayne taking time to just in the car riding with me, talk to me about as you get older, you need to put away violence, you need to put away things like that. And I remember sitting there looking at him saying, he is, he is wanting to pass on wisdom to me. He loves me. He loves my mom. He loves me. He wants to share with me some things that will be helpful to me. And that wasn't the only time. There have been so many times in my life that he has done that very thing. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I wanted just as a way to kind of introduce what we're going to do today, which is going to be a little different, I wanted to talk just a few minutes about being a step-parent because there's an art to being a step-parent. And I'm going to share some things that if you become a step-parent and the children are older, these are some things that I know to be true. If you become a step-parent and the children are very, very, very little, then maybe your role is more like a biological parent. But if you come into someone's life and the kids are already older, I want to share some things that are, I think will be helpful to you. First thing I want to say is this, a great step-parent doesn't force themselves on the kids. A great step-parent doesn't force themselves on the kids. I have seen this where somebody wants to be accepted so bad, it's like, okay, kids, I'm here now. I'm going to be your best friend. We're going to have so much fun. It's going to be great. We're going to just, and the kids are rolling their eyes because it's like, hey, give us time to adjust. Give us time to adjust. So that's very important. There has to be a certain uh, love, of course, but you just need to not force anything too soon. It takes actually years before there's comfort that you want to have in a family. A great step parent often needs to take a back seat when it comes to discipline. Now, again, I'm talking about when the kids are older, if you come into their lives and they're older, a great step parent needs to take a back seat when it comes to discipline. For example, if my mom wanted to discipline me, Dwayne needed to just kind of stand back and let her do what she needed to do, say the things she needed to say, rather than trying to fight to the front to be the one who let me know what I was doing wrong. And he exercised great wisdom there. I knew that he was frustrated with things that I would do, but he just never said it. He just stood back. I knew he supported my mom. And then my mom was the one who hit me in the side of the head or not really, not really mom. But anyway, she's the one who, who was more corrective. Um, remember this, if you come into people's lives and you're there, the kids are a little older, your love should have no bounds, but your authority does. Does that make sense? Your love has no bounds, but your authority does. If someone's 15 years old and you're just coming into their life, it's real hard for you to be able to discipline them. You support their other parent, the biological parent, and that's wisdom. Another thing, a great step-parent doesn't compete. By that, I mean a great step-parent doesn't try to show off and tell you how much better they are than the other parent. And I see that sometimes. I've seen train wrecks because of this. Listen, kids figure out over time which parents were mature, which parents weren't mature, what part of the weight of whatever the problem was should go here or should go there. A great step-parent never trashes the biological parent who's not maybe living in the house at the time. Never, never, never. And I love that Dwayne and my dad are great friends, which is a beautiful thing. And Dwayne has never said anything but to honor my father. And because he honored my father, do you know what that means to me? That is a huge, huge thing. Let me say one final thing, and that's this. A step-parent is so much more than just a parent. A step-parent is more than a parent. They made the choice to love when they didn't have to. You understand? And that's a big, big deal. So to all of you step-parents here, I just want to say thank you for all of the great work that you've done. Would you give it up for all the step-parents that are here?
Now, what we're going to do today that's going to be so different is I looked around at some of the best dads that I know. Jimmy Mayo is one of the best dads I know. He has two of the finest kids I have ever met who are now adults. He speaks with wisdom. He comes from a family where his dad was a great influence on him. And so I said, Jimmy, would you share a few minutes today about that? He said, I will. Then I went to two young fathers. I went to Ray and I said, Ray, I'm blown away. You have four kids. How do you do that? Would you share about Father's Day? Just the, any lesson you want to share from Father's Day, would you share it? He said, sure. And then I went to Ethan, who I also feel is one of the greatest fathers I have ever seen. And I said, would you share uh, just something about Father's Day? And then we're going to try to wrap this up into something that makes sense to y'all. Does that sound like a good plan? I think it's going to be unbelievable. And I'm going to ask my youngest son, Ethan, to come up and get us started. Ethan Water. Yeah. All right. We'll be quick. We've got a lot of others talking. Hey, can I tell you a story real quick? This is how, this is how I, be, I knew I was going to be a father. This is how I found out, Ethan, you're going to be a dad, okay? So Rachel and I are living in central Virginia. And when I say central Virginia, I mean, what I really mean is, is like we were living in the middle of the country. <laughs> like we were in the middle of the sticks. Like you could not be any more camouflage than where we were living at this particular time. And uh, I was uh, working at a church full time in Central Virginia and I was finishing up school. So I was 24 years old and I think Rachel had just turned uh, 23 years old. So we were young. We didn't, I mean, we just, we were dumb. Trust me, we were dumb. And the expectation when we got married was, is was that we will have kids. One day we will have kids. You know, we want to we want to enjoy each other. We want to spend time with each other. We want to travel and we want to see the world. And one of these days when we are ready, we're going to have a kid. And that was all working out pretty well for us, except one time we actually came back to Atlanta for Christmas holidays um, and we had been taking preventative measures to have children and somebody, I won't say who, this girl right here, forgot to take her preventative measure uh, for having kids. And so a couple weeks go by and, you know, we're in Atlanta and then we go back up to Virginia and we go back up there. Everything's good. It actually, it snows like, it's, it snows like 18 inches, huge snowstorm comes in. Uh, not really much uh, that you can do. And one night, Rachel just starts feeling weird, uh, maybe sick. And she goes, hey, you know, I, I hate to do this to you, but well, I mean, will you run up to Walmart to get some medicine? I just feel weird. Um, and then, hey, while you're up there, will you get a pregnancy test? <laughs> So just to remind you where we lived. So we lived in a little town called Prospect, Virginia, and the closest big town is a town called Farmville, and I'm not making that up. Uh, and Farmville was 50, about 15 miles from where I live. So I just want you to imagine what that truck ride was like for me as I get in it at like nine o'clock at night. There's 18 inches of snow on the ground. We are, and by the way, we, we literally are living in a church member's basement. So I'm, <laughs> I'm living in somebody's basement. It's 18 inches of snow on the ground. I got 15 miles to get to Farmville. That's the only town that's got a Walmart so that I can get my wife a pregnancy test. Can you imagine what that was like? So get the test and we come back and Rachel's in the bathroom and she's taking the test and, and she's doing it. And I just get this nervousness about me and I, I just... I think, oh my gosh, am, it, like, is this about to happen? Like, am I about to be, am I about to be a dad? Like, I, I just get nervous about, well, my, if I, if she is pregnant, uh, is my kid gonna like me? Or uh, is my kid gonna want to play catch with me? Uh, am I gonna bandage the boo boos correctly? Like, am I going to be a good dad? And why, as I was thinking that, I hear from the bathroom this guttural and like visceral have you ever seen the movie uh alien like with sigourney where's the old movie with sigourney? 
it sounded like the alien like coming out of the bathroom. So I'm like, oh my God, I gotta, I run over there and I open the door and Rachel's got this uh, the ugliest cry. And I'm thinking, oh, that's a good ugly cry, right? Like we just watched a sweet movie and that's a good ugly cry and shit. But she's like, no, I'm gonna kill you. I can't believe you got me pregnant, cry. Like, congratulations, you're gonna be a dad. And we have had better moments since that moment. And, but that's how I found out I was going to be a dad as I held my wife and she cried through the night and we cried together because we had no idea what we were doing. But you're gonna be a dad, you're gonna be a dad. And that was a scary moment for me. That was a real, real scary moment for me because I, I really did, I had all this doubt, I had a lot of fear about being a good dad because the truth is, is I was not always a good son. And my fear was that my kid or kids would get the absolute worst parts of me. And they wouldn't get the best parts, they would get the worst parts. That they would, my fear was that they would sabotage great opportunities and great relationships one day because those are the things that I had done or that they would go down maybe a destructive path or they would make really, really uh, unwise choices because I, I had gone down those paths and I'd made those choices and that, that, that was real scary for me and I, I was suddenly becoming, uh, it, was, it was suddenly becoming real clear to me that being a dad was like looking in the mirror and looking in the mirror for me was hard and it was incredibly uh, scary for me. I would think back about some of the things my dad would teach me and Ray when we were kids. And he would always teach us these sayings. And one of the sayings that he taught us was, do the thing you fear the most and the death of fear is certain. That's what he would always say to us. And when you're 11 years old and you hear that, you go, all right, that's corny, but all right, we'll say it for you, dad. Do the thing you fear the most and the death of fear is certain. Okay, and then when you're 15 years old, okay, this is corny. All right, but do the thing you fear the most. I know it. And the death of fear is certain. And I don't know if he told us that, so maybe you know, he would believe it or that maybe he just wanted to instill that into us. But it might have taken me 24 years and there was a little season in there where it was really, really rough. And I'm sorry about that. And I love you very much. And thanks for, thanks for always loving me. But it might have taken me 24 years, but I think I, I, I finally started to just barely begin to what that really, really meant. Because I was going to be a dad. I was going to be a dad. And I know, I know that some of you have children, whether you are the father or the stepfather, or if you're the mother, or if you're a friend of the family, or if you're a niece or uncle or cousin, that some of you know people or know kids, maybe your kids, that have not gone down the path that you had dreamed for them, and you live in fear for them. And I want you to know that there is hope for you. And you know this, and you know this is true, you think about when your kids were a baby and you were afraid because you had no idea what you were doing. You had no idea what you were doing and it was real fearful for you, but you just do the thing that you fear the most and you take care of your baby and you provide for your baby the best way that you know how to. And then your kids get older, right? And they get into middle school and they start talking back and you have no idea how you can somehow get into the mind of a 13 year old kid, but you do the thing that you fear the most because you know that being a parent is more important for this 13 year old than being their friend. And then they, they go to high school and they uh, maybe uh, graduate and they, they go to college or maybe they, they just go out into the workforce and to get a job and that is real fearful for you because the part of you really wants to hold on to them but another part of you knows that the thing that you fear the most is that you got to let them go. You got to let them go. You got to you got to let them go. You got to go. They got to go make mistakes and they've got to stumble and they got to live this life and that is fearful for you but you do it anyways because that's what we do. Right, just because you have a baby doesn't mean that you're a father, right? Because being a dad takes real hard, fear-breaking kind of work. And you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? You know exactly what I'm talking about. And I've been a father now for seven years. 
I've been a father now for seven years, and I've got two boys who I love more than anything, and Rachel will tell you that we are still trying to figure it out every day. But we know that when you do the thing that you fear the most, the death of fear is certain. Yeah, I'm going to introduce Jimmy Mayo because he has been one of my spiritual fathers over the past couple of years. And I, he's a musical, we all know his music. But I love Jimmy as a person and I'm coming to know him as a dad. Would you give a nice warm round of applause to Jimmy Mayo? Thank you, bud. Well, I lost the uh, physical embodiment of my dad almost five years ago. Um, Yet, he still lives on, and uh, every once in a while, I'll hear him talk. I'll say something. It's like, oh, oh, God, that was my dad. You know, and he's like, oh, I can't believe I did that. But growing up as a kid, I was really, 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 really intelligent. I mean, if you, if you asked me, I knew everything there was to know. And my dad wasn't very bright. He just, he didn't really have a clue what was going on. And my dad, I thought, was the cheapest man that ever lived. I mean, he just, he was the cheap. One time we got rolled in my yard as a teenager, and we had a huge yard. Um, and my dad proceeded to go out there, pull all of the toilet paper down, put it in big uh, paper grocery sacks, and we used that toilet paper for the next six months. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Um, yeah, he was incredibly cheap, incredibly cheap. And then later on, as I went through life, um, somewhere about when I started to have kids, it was amazing how much smarter my dad got and how much dumber I got. Everything I thought I knew, all of a sudden, is like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know anything anymore, all of a sudden. And, and at that point, my dad became, instead of a cheap man, he became a man of value. I replaced the word cheap with value because I started to understand what he was doing that whole time was instilling some values in me. And I'm just, I want to tell you four quick values that my dad instilled in me. Um, the first one being the value of money. He taught me about money. He taught me how to save money he taught me how that it really doesn't matter how much you make, it's a matter of how much you don't spend. It's a matter of how much you keep or how you invest your money. Um, and so I learned that quickly. You don't have to make a whole lot of money to be wealthy. You just have to learn how to hang on to your money. So I love that. In fact, my dad was such a man of value. When, when he passed away, um, we were cleaning out the barn and found probably between five and six hundred screwdrivers. Yeah. In fact, we were going to give them away at his funeral just as a parting gift kind of thing. But anyway, it, 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 mom and dad owned a lot of uh, rental properties, and they were all spread out around Atlanta. And so, you know, they would be traveling, and they'd, they'd get a call from a renter. We need you to come fix this. Oh, no, I don't have my tools with me. So he'd go by Home Depot, and instead of getting the screwdriver that he needed, he got the value pack every time he went. <laughs> so he never had the screwdriver he needed with him, so he would go buy the value pack. And so all of a sudden, he's got five or 600 screwdrivers when he passes away at uh, 77 years old. Um, so I appreciated that about him. Uh, the second thing Dad taught me, first was money. Second was mischief. My dad was very mischievous. He, uh, he did a lot of things that, uh, that really embarrassed his parents. And so I proceeded to do the same thing. Um, and this is, uh, I know Ray would want me to tell this story because this is probably one of the worst things I ever did. Um, in college, we had a lady, uh, well, a, a lady, a girl, a uh, student who was, uh, who was blind, and she had a seeing eye dog that went with her everywhere she went. We'd go to chapel, and her dog would go with her. She would go to class, and her dog would go with her, and everything else. So some way, somehow, I got hold of one of those dog whistles that you can't hear. 
that people can't hear. And so the four or five guys that knew I had it were sitting in chapel one day, and I blew it. And the dog didn't like it at all. In fact, he started howling and running around the chapel. And, uh, and we're just, we're dying. I know it's, it's horrible. It's cruel. It's awful. But yeah, that's, that's one of those things my dad taught me uh, from hearing stories about him. And then I got to, uh, hear some of these same stories as my son and daughter grew up of things that they did. The third thing my dad taught me was the value of music. I took piano lessons as a kid, and I hated them. Hated, hated, hated. Uh, I would spend four hours at the piano to practice one because if I wasn't playing, it didn't count. So there was a timer there, and so, yeah, I absolutely hated it. But they made an investment in me and forced me to do that. When I was 12, I was much smarter than them and knew that I didn't want to play piano and that I would never be any good at it. I needed to quit and play football. Well, they somehow thought they knew better and made me keep taking lessons anyway. And uh, it wasn't until in my 20s that I really started understanding the value that they put in me that uh, I really uh, loved to this day. It's, you know, it's like my heart. <laughs> my heartbeat is, is music, and I appreciate that value. But the last value my dad instilled me that was the most important was the value of ministry. And ministry is not just what I'm doing right here or what I do behind the piano or what Pastor Ray does here. Ministry is not just what the pastor does. Ministry is something that happens 24-7. It happens everywhere you go, in everything you do, in every person that you speak to, in every person you come in contact with. It's the way that you love. It's the way that you show grace to people. That's ministry. Ministry is not preaching about the good news. It's about being the good news to somebody. Um, and that was the greatest value I feel that my dad gave me. And uh, I think, did you show that picture of me with my kid, my son and grandfather and my dad? This, my grandfather was actually Jimmy Mayo the second. He was a pastor here in Atlanta on Boulevard. Actually, it started on Washington Street and then it moved to Boulevard and uh, and all of that. He was a pastor for many years. My dad was the third. I'm the fourth. And my son there is the fifth. Um, so I have a great heritage, and I'm very, very appreciative of that. And I'm about to become a grandfather, who is not going to be the sixth, about to become a grandfather. My daughter's pregnant, and I'm looking forward to learning another value, um, learning how I, as a grandfather, get to speak into, uh, into my life. And maybe Ray will say more about grandfathers at some point. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what I have. I appreciate my dad. I miss my dad uh, very, very much. It's been almost five years. And, uh, but more than anything, I appreciate the values he instilled in me that I can turn around and instill in my kids and my grandkids. So... Without that, let's, uh, who we're going back to. So Pastor Ray, thank you for who you are and I appreciate you. That was awesome. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. That was awesome. Y'all, many, many, many years ago, I don't even know how long, 30, nearly 30 years ago, I had a radio show in the afternoons and when the middle, midday disc jockey was not there and I had to fill in for him, part of his schedule was getting online with Jimmy Mayo, who Jimmy's grandfather, who was a very famous pastor in Atlanta, and he did a, uh, I don't remember if it was daily or weekly, but he did a show on the radio, and I would get to, when the, the other disc jockey, a man named Warren Roberts wasn't there, I would get to fill that spot, and I would call Jimmy Mayo on the phone, and he would do his little talk to all of his people that were listening, and he's the most popular, one of the most popular preachers in Atlanta, and the thought that I would one day get to work with Jimmy Mayo is amazing to me. One more time, Jimmy is a great, great guy, great leader. Um, 
All right, I wanna to talk to you just a little bit about some ways that my dad has to me uh, represented a picture of what God is like. Um, and not in maybe the ways that you would think. You know, my dad would tell you, uh, son, don't compare me to being godlike. I am the most flawed. I've been flawed my whole life. His sisters are here from, from uh, New Orleans and from Houston. You want to hear some stories about my dad? You need to hear stories from these two ladies because my dad has been colorful and has just been a mess, sometimes a mess. But there are some things about him that to me are just godlike, and I wanted to share them to, with you. One of those things is he has loved me unconditionally. There's never been one second that I did not know he loved me unconditionally. And I have not always done it right. I have made big mistakes in my life, but my dad has always loved me unconditionally. I've always known that he is in my corner. I've always known he is my advocate. I have always known he is my great encourager. Ethan alluded to the fact that Ethan went through a rough patch, uh, end of high school, beginning of college. And uh, it was scary, he kind of got into drugs and some things that we wished he had never gotten into. And I would go talk to my dad and I would be so afraid. And dad would always say, you know what, but look at all the things he's got right. Look at all the things, look at how loving he is at his core. Look at how kind he is at his core. He's gonna get through this. He is going to get, he didn't jump on the bandwagon of beating up Ethan and saying, you know, just kind of a tear down kind of a thing. He always was very, very positive. His love for me, his love for his grandchildren, always unconditional. He might get frustrated, but we always knew we were in his family. And if we were in his family, then he would love us unconditionally. We teach here, by the way, that if God is Trinity and we believe he is, and Jesus is the face of God and we believe that he is, then you can trust in this life that the universe is benevolent and you can know that God is on your side. And that's huge. I, I feel so advantaged over so many people because I grew up knowing that my father was on my side. And I know more and more and more as I learn about God, he is on our side. He is for us, not against us. And so that was a great, great lesson to me. Another thing about my dad is like God, he passed on wisdom to me that was not just theoretical, but that was honestly practical and good. Now, let me share this with you. When I was 16 years old, my dad had to move to Australia for business. And he said, you want to go? And it's like, yes, I would love to go. So I moved to Sydney, Australia with my dad. Enrolled in a boys high school in Sydney, Australia. Just me and my dad just going to live together. And I remember one day when we were in Sydney, Australia, we decided to go to a pool, hang out. So we go to this huge swimming pool and there's all these college age people and, and young people in their 20s and it's a happening place and it's me and dad and we're just watching everything. And there is a diving board, then there is a another diving board, then there is a another diving board, then there's a platform that is way, way up there. And so I'm just, watching. Nobody's going up there, but I thought I'm going to go up and just, I'm going to jump off that top thing. And so I climbed up the, the first level and climbed up the second level and climbed up the third level. And I got up to the very top platform and I looked off the edge and everybody stopped in the pool and they're all looking at me. And it's like, there's no way I'm going to jump off this thing. So I <laughs> I go back, it's one of the most embarrassing things in my life, I climb back down the ladder, and that which is very humiliating, I'm 16 years old, and you think you're bulletproof 16, but there's no possible way I'm gonna do that. So anyway, I go over to my dad, and I say, yeah, that's crazy, I'd never go off that. And he said, watch this. I'm telling you a true story, it's totally true. And so he goes over, he's a big guy, uh, probably 220 pounds at the time, 5'11", looks kind of like Brutus, black beard and a, a, a kind of bushy hair. And he begins to climb up 
the ladders. He goes up the first flight, and he goes up the second flight, and he goes up the third flight, and he goes up to the fourth flight, and he walks to the edge, and everybody in the pool, they stop. They're young. None of them are climbing off this thing. They're young, and they watch my slightly overweight father stand at the very edge of the platform, toes hanging over the edge. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's going to die. I'm in Australia. I don't even know what I'm going to do in Australia if he dies. And uh, he does the most amazing back gainer thing where he's flipping through the air and then he goes into the water. It is like Olympics. It, he goes into the water, barely a splash. These people that we don't even know, they begin to cheer. I mean, they begin to cheer. Everybody's just, they're going crazy cheering. And my dad swims over to me and I'm so proud I have tears in my eyes. And he swam over to me and he said, can I tell you something? I said, sure. He said, don't ever do that without a jock strap on. That is practical, good wisdom, is it not? I mean, that's, that was very important. So anyway, my dad has always been like that with practical, good wisdom. And it just reminds me that God's wisdom is practical. Listen, churches argue about all kind of theoretical stuff. They argue about all kind of, this is what this means. And we want to make sure that we get this word exactly right. And because this is how it works in the tabernacle and you got to do all this kind of stuff. Can I tell you something? God's wisdom is love him and love people. And when you do that, life is so good. It is so good. It is so good. So when you have people, and some people like all the charts. They like going to church where it's like, now we're going to study this part and we're going to go to the book of Revelation. We're going to study all this. You're going to learn all of this stuff. And it's The best wisdom is wisdom that is practical, that can be used. I don't care if you know the charts from the book of Revelation. If you pass a a poor person and you don't feel compassion and you don't try to reach out a hand and help them and you don't have compassion for people in this world, who cares about the charts? So that second thing I think is very, very important and I wanted you to, to get that. Third thing is this. My dad has always been empathetic and compassionate to the underdog. I've talked about that here before. I won't go into much detail, but I believe my dad has always looked at people and he's always tried to look beyond just the one view of the story, which is they are down on their luck, they're bad, they've done something wrong, it's their fault. He always tries to see the other side of the story. And so life is more complex than some people are comfortable with. And yet I think in its complexity, it is much closer to the truth And it's much closer to the heartbeat of God. 1973, we lived in South Africa. It was under apartheid. Again, my dad was very good at what he did. Um, He was a computer expert in the days of the large mainframe computers, and we traveled all over the world. So we're in South Africa, and it was under apartheid, and that was very awkward to us because we, I never had been brought up with one ounce of racism in our house ever, but we're living in a place where the minority is in control. Whites are in control and blacks are basically kept together in small townships and they can't be on the street after dark and they have no rights at all. And we are down there and we are working, or my dad is working. And one day we discover that the maid who would come in to clean the apartment that we lived in was in our garbage can and dipping out the food we had thrown away from the night before to take home to her children. And uh, at the time, I think the, the wage was about $30 a month that a Afrikaans, a, a black person in South Africa, that's about their wage. And I remember tears rolling down my dad's face. And I remember that he set about to, while we were there, do what he could to make a difference, which meant tipping extraordinarily when we would ever go out for service until you would see the waiters and the waitresses crying and being able to slip money, never as a way to brag on himself, but just as a way to quietly try to help people who were disadvantaged. And I think that is a beautiful thing. One more thing I want to say, and by the way, that's the heartbeat of God. We have a hard time as Americans because we read the Bible as people who are fairly affluent and who have a lot, but the Bible was written primarily to people who were under um, conquest. They were, they were, under the authority of others, and most of the Bible is written when they had no authority at all. So it's hard sometimes for us to put ourselves in that position of what does it feel like to be the underdog, but I'm grateful my dad had the wisdom to, to have that sense. Final thing is this, and I think it's very, very important. 
uh, my dad knew that I was wired a certain way, my sister was wired a certain way, and it's important to raise up your kids. This, you know the scripture, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You've heard that. And sometimes the preachers say, that means you raise them up in church, and when they get old, even if they've been wild, they'll come back to church. That's not what it means. What it means is Jimmy's dad knew there was going to be music in his son. He knew it. And so he raised him up in the way he should go, which was in accordance to how Jimmy was wired. And when he is old, he won't depart from it. It is his life. Well, I have some traits like my dad. I have some things that are very, very natural to me that's, that's very, very important. And, and we, we share that, and I love that. Uh, poetry. Uh, my dad on long trips would teach me poems. I don't know if anybody else ever did that with your dads. That's not everybody's thing, but he did it, and it resonated with me. I ran across this morning a poem that my dad used to teach me when I was a little boy. I had forgotten these words, but he taught me this when I was a little boy. It's a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, who had been a, a very sick as a child. And so if you can imagine me when I'm five years old, if we were taking a trip, my dad would teach me these verses when I was sick. The, the poem is called The Land of Counterpain, and counterpain is a, a word for bedspread, okay? So this is a, a, a poem about a little boy playing in his bed. When I was sick and lay abed, I had two pillows at my head, and all my toys beside me lay to keep me happy all the day. And sometimes for an hour or so, I watched my leaden soldiers go with different uniforms and drills among the bedclothes and through the hills. And sometimes sent my ships and fleets all up and down among the sheets or brought my trees and houses out and planted cities all about. I was the giant, great and still, that sits upon the pillow hill and sees before him dale and plain in the pleasant land of counterpane. So I'm a little boy, and it's like, I like that stuff. I like that stuff. There are other things, you know, that my dad did. My dad never meets a stranger, and so I kind of pick up on that. I, that's more me. That's not my mom's style, more my dad's style, but that's me. But then there are some things that I just am a million miles opposite of my dad. I'm not mechanically curious at all. Like, I don't care why the light works. I just want the light to work, you know? Well, my dad doesn't think like that. He's mechanically curious. I was not mathematically gifted. My dad was mathematically gifted. I wasn't really interested in how computers work, but that was his deal, or how different tools work. Jimmy, I have lived with this thought that when my dad passes, I'm going to inherit all these tools. I don't want all these tools. I don't know what to do with all these tools, you know? It's like, I don't know. I never fixed anything. But my dad understood that I wasn't like him in those things. I will tell you this, he sure was happy when I married Jane. She's the son he always hoped he'd have that he can... <laughs> Because she does like to fix stuff, so that's a good thing. But the toughest thing in the world is when a dad wants a football player and the son is an artist. And the dad's not wise enough to know, I need to raise my son up in the way he should go. Which doesn't mean he's got to become a football player. It means he needs to become the greatest artist in the world he could possibly be. Well, I'm honored to have my older son come up and share with us. Would you give a round of applause to Raymond Kendrick Waters? I'll be quick, guys, because I know that there's a lot of lunches to get to. And uh, even if you're not going to lunch, I'm going to lunch. So we're going to make this quick and get out of here. But when you first mentioned us a week ago to start thinking about, you know, just what are some um, things about Father's Day, you know, start to think of some ideas. The, the, there was a verse that kept running through my head, and it was, spare the rod and spoil the child. Have you heard that? How many of you grew up with that? You either heard it in your house or maybe, maybe you, you grew up with that in, in church. That was something that you were familiar with. Um, it, it actually comes from a, a, it's kind of a paraphrase from a proverb that says, whoever spares the rod hates their children. And so as we're growing up, I mean, it's like, if I don't spank my kid, I'm, I am hating them. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm not doing right by them. That's, that's how we grew up. How, how many of us over the generations and generations? Tommy, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but real quick, and, and Curtis, you had it up there. The word rod here in Hebrew is translated as shebet. Can you say that with me? Shebet. 
Very good. One more time. We'll get it. Shea bet. And we're going to, let's put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But this is, this is part of the church that, that kind of hurts my heart. But a lot of times, and you've, you, you alluded to it, but we read the Bible so literally sometimes that we miss a lot of the beauty and the mystery and the creativity and the pictures. Uh, we, 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 we miss it when we strip it of all that wonder and we just read it word for word. And, and think, about, think about how Jesus talked about the love of God and about a relationship with God. How do you, how do you describe love? How do you describe what love is? How do you how do you say what a relationship is like? God, G- Jesus would use words like, God's like an old lady who lost her coin. Or, 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 or in Ecclesiastes, it talks about God being like the wind. Like you don't even, you don't know where he comes or where he goes. And sometimes it sits on some of us and sometimes it passes some of us. And we have no idea. We, you can't put your finger on it. And Jesus says, sometimes a relationship with God, it's like this, this parable child. And it's like he... It's like he came home and that's what it feels like. Those are the type of stories and metaphors and symbols that we see Jesus using. King David in the 23rd Psalm, he's writing about what his relationship with God is. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And he says, read it on the screen with me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, this is interesting. The word that David uses for rod and staff is the word shebet. And we saw that earlier in spare the shebet and you spoil the child. So maybe, maybe the better translation of rod is like a shepherd's crook, like a shepherd's staff. And we have read it for so many years as a baseball bat or a uh, some, something that you would strike with. But instead, in the Proverbs, the writer is saying, if you spare the, the rod, if you're not keeping your sheep going on the right direction, that child is going to end up in misery. He's going to miss up, end up in death. And so instead of striking, maybe the purpose of the shepherd or the parent or the father here is to show that sheep, show them the direction they're supposed to go. And when they get off, just kind of remind them a little bit that, hey, this is the way we're going. This is where, this is where we need to end up. And this is how we're going to get there. So as I look back over my teenage years primarily, I, I just want to kind of share some of the moments that my dad did not spare the rod, spare the shebet, but he kept us, he kept us going. Um, Ethan and I were... We were homecoming kings and we were captains of the football team. And yet there was a, a young 15 year old African-American kid at our school who was, he was gay and he just, he couldn't be at us. He didn't feel safe in his neighborhood or in his house anymore. And so for, for a season, he lived with us. You remember? Um, that's Shea Bet. He's just showing us, hey, this is how we do life, Shea Bet. There was an obese special needs kid that didn't even go to our school, teenagers. And I don't know how he ended up in a house, but it, he went to school with you, Jen, I think. And I don't even know how he ended up, but he stayed a season at, a, at our house. And you even got him involved with the AV team at the church. And so for the first time, this, this obese special needs kid who's always been on the outskirts of, of, of the rest of the teenagers has a place at the table and he feels like a million bucks. That spare the shebet. A friend of yours, I, I know you grew up with him, um, struggled with some severe schizophrenia, and he, he, he spent most of his life um, on the streets, and he didn't even want, he didn't want to, he didn't want, you'd offered him a room, and he wouldn't come in, but you would make up jobs for him to do at the house that we didn't even need to do just so that you could give him money, and he'd come in, and we'd have a meal with him, and that was Shea Bet, spare the rod. No, he was not sparing the rod. I remember um, we had a praise team singer who was being abused by her husband. And you got the call one night that it was happening again. And you said, Ray, get in the car. And so I don't, I don't, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not at a back. What am I, am I going to be back up? Am I here to be a witness for the police? I, I, I don't know, but I just remember sitting in that car thinking something wasn't right. And we didn't know what we were going to do, but we just got to get in the car and we got to take off. That was being burned in our minds. This is, this is what you do. This is the way that we live life. This is not sparing the rod. Countless number of divorcees and closeted adults and addicts who fell off uh, again and guys that just couldn't catch a, a good luck 
would come in and out of our house and we would share meals with them. And it was your way of saying, this is how we do life. This is how we're going to do it. And then you started a church for people who felt like they didn't belong in church and maybe that God couldn't love them. And the tagline for that church was, this is the perfect place for people who aren't. And you talked about God not throwing away broken things, but him reusing and molding them into something beautiful. Shape it. And you were a friend to the friendless and a father to the fatherless and a pastor to the pastorless. Shebet. I, I, I know for a lot of pastor's kids, scripture and doctrine and study and memorization, that's the rod. That's the way that life is. That's the way that we understand this relationship with God. But I'll be honest, I can't squ- quote a lot of scripture verbatim. And yet, because of this man's shebet, because of him not keeping the way of life from us, I've got that word, that that living word, more burned on my heart than anything that I can imagine. And I know it. And I know in, in, in Deuteronomy, it says God shows no partiality. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you, and he gives them food and clothing. That's the heart of God, and that's what, that's what I know. And Jesus says, the, 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 the religious people said, when we say, Lord, Lord, are we going to see you in, in, in the promised land? And it, it's almost like they're saying, we, I've accepted you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm going to see you, right? And Jesus says, you missed it. It's when you didn't feed the hungry. It's when you didn't clothe the homeless. That was when you were experiencing me. And I'm so thankful that this man, every step along the way, was helping us see that that's the heart of God. That's the, 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 the kingdom of God that we're called to bring about. 